um, our next speaker is Stephen Klim from Bar Brown. He'll talk about the compactness of modelized spaces of finite topology embedded and minimal surfaces. Okay, uh, thanks uh, to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, so, regardless of the, the title of this talk, it's actually going to be a little bit more about uh, uh, desingularizing constructions for minimal surfaces. So, the theorem we prove uh, is basically better understood as simply an example of desingularization. So, it's probably better to talk about it that way. Um, so, desingularizations uh, mean different things to different people. Uh, so, you know, it's not exactly clear what one means by desingularization or, or doubling. Uh, usually what one tries to do is take two intersecting sur uh, surfaces that satisfy some sort of geometric condition, uh, like minimality, and replace them with a, uh, not always, but usually a family of uh, embedded surfaces that are in some sense uh, close to that given surface. Uh, sometimes with high genus, sometimes not. So Frank just gave us a nice talk the other day uh, where he was apparently inserting single necks to, to small mean, create small mean curvature embedded surfaces. Uh, in my context, they're almost always high genus. Uh, so uh, the basic ingredient for all the constructions that I'm going to be talking about are uh, a family of uh, minimal surfaces in R3, in uh, known as uh, Shirk Towers. And I'm just going to write them like this. So since they're on R3, it's probably just better to draw them and then uh, list the properties we need. So they look something like this. So imagine you have two parallel planes uh, that are separated by some vertical translation. And then imagine taking them and increasing them by some angle. and then joining them along the crease by a whole collection of catenoidal necks. So to get some surfaces that look something like this. So these guys exist. Um, so this angle here, let me call this, this little angle theta. So these guys exist for all angles theta. And they have several nice properties, so this guy so they're uh, 2 pi uh, singly periodic. Uh, so of course, they're embedded and minimal. Uh, in the orientation I've drawn them, uh, they're uh, invariant uh, through uh, a coordinate plane reflection. And, uh, uh, right, so, oh yeah, so they're uh, also very rapidly asymptotic. <coughs> to four half planes. Okay, so since it's not exactly clear what's, even to me, what we mean by desynchronization, it's better just to sort of start with an example and do it, and then you can say, that's kind of what I mean, right? Uh, so by the end of the talk, hopefully we can uh, sort of motiv motivate some sort of general philosophy, and then hopefully in the ensuing, hopefully a year, we can re replace the word philosophy with theorem. But right now, we just have, at least as far as I, I'm concerned, I have certain catalog of examples, but there's united by a common theme, and hopefully we can uh, convince people that uh, the general philosophy will, uh, should be reasonable uh, and fairly widely ap applicable. Okay. Oh, and by the way, I will get to the theorems mentioned in the title talk in time. So we will actually. So let's talk about the following example. Uh, I want to make a minimal surface that looks essentially like this at a distance. So this guy is going to be an R3 embedded, and he's going to look a lot like uh, two catenoids of the same scale uh, at a distance and with some topology around the intersection circle. Right? Uh, so how do you do this? 
Well, I sort of want to decompose this process into several steps that are somewhat independent from each other. The first thing you want to do is bend and correct the Shirk Tower. So how do we do this? Well, what I want to do is I want to take, so I'm just going to draw sort of a profile view of, the Shirk, Shirk, of a given Shirk Tower. It doesn't really matter what its angle is. And I want to take its intersection with a tube. Um, and what I want to do, essentially, so maybe I should continue this tube into the blackboard a little bit. Something like this. So you have a whole bunch of necks sort of going down like this. So we have our shirt surface in the tube. What we want to do here is bend it around a tube, uh, basically around a circle a very large radius so that it looks something like this, more next around here. Roughly like this. Okay, is this bad drawing clear to people? Okay, uh, who, okay. I can never tell, right? If you draw these things by yourself in your office for a while, you think they look good and then, <laughs> you, you never know, right? So this is basically what you want to do. So there's, a, there's natural ways of doing this. There's not a canonical way of doing this. There's natural ways of doing this. So let me not write down an equation. It's kind of plausible the way you might want to wrap a cylinder on the circle. All right. So what I want to do here is essentially correct this, uh, get a nice, what I'm going to call flexible family of shirk surfaces and tubes. So basically what I want to do here is I, it's probably easiest to think, it th think of it this way. I want to basically pull back the geometry of the tube back to the straight cylinder, and I want to do the following thing. I want to find an operator Q star, which basically just measures the mean curvature of uh, B of a normal graph uh, by a function F uh, over the shirk, given shirk surface. So it just basically pulls back the problem to the tube. Uh, it's nothing fancy, but the point here uh, so maybe I should say that I want the radius of this circle that we're bending around to be uh, equal to, actually, I was going to write approximately, but just equal to tau to the minus 1, where here tau greater than 0 is a small. Right, OK. So this is the setup. So a couple points here is that, uh, because of the geometry of the problem in this rotationally symmetric case, uh, this Q star operator is nice and, uh, pr and uh, translational, translationally invariant. Uh, also, we can choose tau small enough. So that in any norm you really like, uh, the distance between Q star and just the flat mean curvature equation for normal graphs over a surface is less than any delta you like. So you can just essentially just, it's, you're, the way you're setting this up is to treat this problem as a perturbation of the flat mean curvature problem on the surface. So that's all we do. So, uh, okay. So what do we actually want to do here? Well, we want to prove the following proposition, which, for lack of better terminology, I'm just saying, uh, 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 flexible, existence of flexible Q star shirks and tubes. So what we want to do, be able to do here is actually just correct these guys back to, me, back to minimality, rather their images, uh, while being able to pres prescribe small uh, Dirichlet boundary d data in the tube, right? So, okay, so one thing to mention before I go on is that, so I mentioned that these, these Shirk surfaces are very rapidly asymptotic to a collection of four half planes, right? So if you choose the radius of the tube sufficiently large, you can make these boundary cur cur uh, curves as close as you like to a collection of four lines, right? So these very closely approximate the rotationally symmetric problem. They're, not, they're periodic, and they're not rotationally invariant, but 
uh, uh, they're pretty darn close to it. And you can set the problem up so that you get these as close to straight lines as you like, right? So what we do here is uh, actually I should look out, get the write down the right quantifiers and everything. So the proposition is that so there exists delta. There should probably be two deltas here, but just one delta is just a uh, fine such that uh, for all Q star, so we need a translational invariant or just two pi periodic, and uh, gamma, say what gamma is in a second, uh, satisfying, so any norm you like, H minus Q star minus H is less than delta, and uh, gamma minus gamma naught is less than delta. There exists a surface which I'm just calling S, Q star gamma, such that, so S is minimal, or I should say B of S is minimal. Uh, smooth dependence on Q star and, uh, and uh, gamma. So actually, before I finish this punchline, let me say what these things are, because I just really need to say what gamma is. So gamma is just uh, these boundary curves right here. So what we're setting up ourselves to say is we can wiggle the boundary a little bit and preserve minimality. So this is not much of a statement so far. It's essentially uh, just some basic, don't even really call it, call it perturbation theory. It's just it's a small perturbation theory still problem. Smooth the, okay, the tensor will be in beta and gamma. And the last condition is that, so Q star of S, is it, uh, no, I already said that, I'm sorry. So intersection, if you take S and intersect it with T, right, you get this curve gamma. And uh, right, that's it. Right, okay, so all we're saying here is that as long as we choose the radius around which we're bending the stroke surface sufficiently large, and we choose sufficiently small boundary values, once we fix tau, then we can perturb this guy, solve the boundary condition freely for small boundary values, and so that it's still minimal. So if we want to actually do a genuine doubling construction, or desynchronizing construction, that's the minimum we have to do. Right, because if you look inside a, small, a tiny tubular neighborhood, you're going to get something that looks exactly like a Shirk surface, except that it has different boundary values from the original one. So this is sort of the minimum ingredients that you need to do any construction like this. OK. Right. So, so the second step in this construction is, uh, let's tr try to turn this into a desynchronizing problem. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, let me redraw just a profile of our Shirk surface, now corrected and living inside this tube. Okay, so it's, it's sort of, it has boundary and then its arms are sort of flapping in the wind. So if we want to make this a genuine, uh, what is it, a desynchronizing problem, we need to get something to attach these wings to get a complete surface, right? Well, as mentioned, uh, we can make these boundary curves as close as we like uh, by taking the radius of the tube sufficiently large to simply a, a collection of, of four lines, right? So we have a whole family of solutions uh, outside the tube with boundary equal to four lines, right? They're just catenoidal lens, right? So what you can do is find some, so the first thing you're gonna try to do is just find some nice ends that basically look like catenoids that closely approximate the solution, right? More specifically, you want to prove the following proposition.
So let me just call this compatible ends. So in fact, let me call, label this, this stuff, uh, say, lambda 1, lambda 2, uh, lambda 3, and lambda 4. Right, OK. So we want the following thing. So there exists, uh, let me actually write it like this. Uh, right, so, so for all, right, so there exists, again, a delta greater than 0, uh, such that uh, uh, for all gamma, uh, with, in this case, just this norm of gamma is less than this gamma naught stuff, uh, less than delta. There exists some surface, some collection of surfaces, gamma i, sigma, such that, OK, so the first thing we need is that these guys are, all these gamma i's are embedded minimal. Uh, you also need that uh, if you take the union of all the gammas, the disjoint union, and you intersect with the tube, you just get gamma. Um, and the last thing you need, ah, is that uh, they have, they give, uh, Zero, what I'm going to call zero, average uh, Neumann defect. Across T. OK, so what do I mean by this? OK, so if you fix a catenoidal end like this, you can certainly, uh, especially if they're, so this is a catenoidal end uh, of a scale approximately equal to tau to the minus one. So you've taken a fixed catenoid, a fixed scale, and blown it up, blown it up by a very big factor, right? Um, we can certainly wiggle the boundary a little bit, just basic, basically by from standard mumbo jumbo. Uh, so there's an, another sort of parameter freedom, which is that through any given circle, there's a one parameter family of catenoidal ends. Right? So you just play with the log growth, and you get a whole one parameter family there. So you, I've drawn this nice picture, but it's also just possible to solve the Dirichlet problem uh, and get an approximately catenoidal end with something that has a corner right here. So you could do this as well. Right? So the goal is to be able to pick the right, solve the Dirichlet problem with the right catenoidal end simply by varying the log growth of the end. So you get zero, zero average uh, Neumann defect. And what I mean by Neumann defect is that if you look at the outward pointing conormal uh, right here, let's just call it eta plus, and the inward pointing conormal right here, induced by these surfaces. And if you look at eta plus and eta minus, you average over each of these uh, boundary components, right? you get zero. So this is the compatibility condition that you need. And it's quite easy to solve in this case. OK. So again, you solve this. You do this just by some standard mumbo jumbo. So the thing is about these, uh, uh, these catenoid lines is that they're all sort of conformal cylinders. Uh, conformal to cylinders with very small uh, second fundamental form. Everything converges nicely back to the minimal surface equation on a nice flat cylinder on a flat plane, I should say. Uh, the linear problem converges to, nicely to Laplacian, so you can just, just do everything by, with your bare hand. There's nothing fancy happening, on there, happening there. OK. OK, so that's the second step. So we have these flexible shirk surfaces, and we have these compatible ends. Uh, so now the step, step three is uh, just correcting uh, the Neumann defect.
Okay. So how do we do this? So what we've done so far is we've managed to construct a nice, at least C0 surface for any choice, a parameterized family of C0 surfaces uh, parameterized by their intersection curve with the cylinder. Right? So what I want to do here is I want to set some surface sigma gamma equal to the intersection, actually should it be of the, the S surface corresponding to, to gamma uh, with uh, the disjoint union over all the, uh, uh, these gamma guys. So that's what I've drawn over here. And this guy, OK, so we see 0, Lipschitz across the boundary. And you, it has something slightly better than just being generally, uh, generally Lipschitz across the boundary. It's this, at least the average of this Neumann defect is equal to 0. If we can get the total Neumann defect at each point, like the pointwise defect to be equal to 0, then we're done. OK, so what do we actually want to do here? Uh, so we're going to set this up as a, as a basically a shatter six point, a fixed point, but it doesn't really matter. So what one does is you take, take a nearby boundary curve, right? Here's some uh, boundary curve. And uh, we look at at D, which I'm going to call D underline, to be the uh, Neumann defects at gamma. Right. So there, there's four of them. There's four functions. And uh, what we want to do here is. Uh, Find we want to find gamma such that uh, this uh, the d bar is equal to zero. So I want to give this map a name. So. We're going to say uh, phi or c of, of gamma is just the map gamma maps to underline d. So you look at some collection of, of boundary curves right here. You pr uh, prescribe some boundary values in t. You look at the corresponding uh, compatible solution outside, right? So they're matched up to c zero. And so they have zero average. That's what we mean by like compatible. But they're not pointwise average, average equal to zero. And this is the guy you want to correct so that's actually pointwise equal to zero. So a couple points. So gamma here, or C here, depends smoothly on tau. On tau greater than zero. Um, C of zero. Uh, is basically just uh, well. Actually, let me let me just say what the linearization. Uh, the C, so C prime when tau is equal to zero is uh, a Dirichlet and Neumann map. Just at a flat Schurk surface. Uh, so I'll say what this is and why this is true. So. As our parameter tau goes to zero, the scale of these Schurk surfaces goes to infinity. So you end up just in the limit, just getting essentially the blow up of uh, these, these, uh, these catenoidal lens, which just look like four half planes. Right? So what we do here, when you solve, out, you solve inside, so basically what we're doing here is we're looking inside and we're looking outside. And we're solving the minimal surface equation. So when tau is equal to zero, there's no perturbation going on. It's just a nice flat minimal surface equation. You solve inside with some. Uh, some boundary conditions, you solve outside of some boundary conditions with the same boundary conditions, right? And you linearize this, right? So what happens if you look at the, the Dirichlet, you, you fix some, some linear Dirichlet data 
on the boundary uh, here, you solve inside and you outside, and you look at the induced Neumann difference between these two solutions. Right? So this is a nice operator. So let's just call this <coughs> phi. So it turns out that phi here is a, it's a boundary linear operator. Um, it does have kernel, but uh, not in these zero average function spaces. So this guy is actually an invertible operator. So at this point, we're just ready to set up a fixed point, uh, fixed point argument, just using smoothness and tau, uh, and uh, the smoothness of the entire operator, right? So then C is essentially just equal to uh, maybe C is some F naught plus uh, phi acting on F plus some rem remainder terms, which are easily controlled. And uh, we can solve the linear equation since this guy has no kernel and it's nice and self adjoint. Ah, self adjoint. Right. Uh, at this point, just a uh, Formal stuff, right? So we, it's just Banach-based stuff. We have a nice, smooth family of operators. Uh, we can solve when tau is equal to zero. Uh, the linear operator is invertible, so it's essentially I've set it up as a shadow fixed point because this is what I'm used to doing. We could probably do an implicit function theorem here as well. Okay. So what is the result? So the result is, let me write it as theorem and just draw a picture. Uh, so if I remove these, this guy like this, and this guy right here, then the theorem is that this guy, this, this guy exists. As long as the genus is high. Okay, so that's the simplest possible case of this stuff, right? So basically, the basic ingredients are just these uh, uh, flexible shirk surfaces and tubes, right? And this ability to freely prescribe uh, the, the average Neumann defect across the boundaries in this case. So that's all you need to do this desynchronization. So I should say that this guy, this particular example I just set up is just a somewhat simple consequence of stuff that Nikos did, uh, Kapolius in uh, 1997. Right. So what this means here is that, let me say a little bit more quantitatively, is that if you take for all, for all theta, uh, there exists a G naught such that, uh, uh, let me say this surface exists for genus G greater than G naught. So the point here, is that G naught depends on theta, right? So if you want to allow theta to go to zero, then you have to do a little more work. So right now, we, if you fix an intersection uh, uh, sort of angle of these two catenoids, you can desingularize them and get a surface with some genus, but the genus depends on the angle of the singularization. So if you, if you want to make, sure, get, make this, this lower bound uniform in theta, you have to do a little bit more work. Okay, let me just see how much time we have. Okay, I think we're doing well. So let me say a little bit about that, although not too much. Uh, so let's do maybe example two, which is just the same, uh, same picture, but let's keep G uh, bounded away from uh, infinity uh, as theta goes to zero. 
OK. So basically, the entire process works identically. Uh, there is a little bit, so all the work is done is in the fact that you need a little bit stronger statement for, uh, uh, about the shirk surfaces, right? So what you need is uh, the statement about flexible uh, Q star shirk shirks, but you have to replace this with uh, uh, is a statement, but for lack of better terminology, I'm going to call just uniformly flexible. Uniformly flexible. Okay. So what does this mean? So the problem is, uh, if you look at these shirk surfaces in a tube from a profile view, right? So if this angle, if we want to allow this angle to go to zero, uh, the problem is that the the uh, geometry of these shirk of these surfaces degenerates as theta goes to zero. So if theta goes to zero, these guys converge to uh, away from. Uh, the, the, the two pi times the integers along the, Z, or the, the axis of periodicity, they converge to uh, just a plane of multiplicity two. And all the curvature gets concentrated near that, uh, near that lattice. Um, so if th this angle is theta, then you certainly can't wiggle the boundary uh, by more than a, a, at least some fixed constant times theta and get a, uh, a, an embedded surface. Uh, so simply, what you have to do is just simply replace the previous statement of flexibility with, okay, so this is maybe not the best terminology, some sort of uniformly flexible statement, which just tells you uh, how this stuff depends on theta. So there exists delta again, such that, uh, so we can keep the perturbation of this Q star operator uh, as small, just uniformly small without making it small in terms of theta, but our boundary values are only allowed to change by small constant times theta. OK. So what this means is, so as long as this Q star operator is delta close, Right? So in particular, we're still allowed to, uh, to bend the shirk surface around arbitrarily small, arbitrary, arbitrary large radii independent of theta. Right? Uh, we can only wiggle the boundary by a small constant times theta. So this is what's sort of forced on us by the geometry, the shirk surfaces, and, uh, and the whole problem. Um, but once you have this, everything works exactly as before. You can still find your compatible uh, solutions outside. Uh, and uh, uh, basically by the same sort of an, uh, naive, meth naive methods and uh, apply this, look at the Dirichlet and Neumann operator as before and get the exact same results. So it turns out to be kind of a pain in the butt to do that, to go from just the flex flexible to uniformly flexible. It's not that bad, but it, it's not that hard but it was kind of a pain in the butt. It's the kind of thing where you only do it if you really need to finish a paper. Uh, so yeah, so the way you do this is you really have to study the geometry of the Shirk surfaces as the theta, theta tends to zero. And you can say quite precisely exactly how they degenerate into, into the uh, plane of multiplicity two. So they're, I should say maybe they're given implicitly as a zero set of a very simple function. And you can just use that function to get all the information you want. So it's, it's relatively uh, prosaic. OK. So maybe I want to state something that will perhaps be a little bit more interesting to Oh, right. So the one thing I should say is that uh, uh, so this, the second example is essentially what Niels and I did uh, in our paper to show that these, uh, the space M4G is, uh, is non-compact. So uh, the space of M4G. M4G is minimal, uh, minimal surfaces in uh, R3 with finite topology, four ends in genus G. Uh, so this tells you, this just constructs a non-compact family of surfaces 
in R3, which goes to the boundary of the moduli space, right? As this angle goes to zero, this thing just leaves every compact set of the moduli space. The geometry, de geometry de degenerates. I should say this is basically what we did. It's not exactly what we did. The reason why it's not exactly is that this particular surface I've constructed uh, is actually not embedded. So you can prove it's not embedded. OK. So actually, Ross proves it's not embedded years before we constructed it. Um, so the problem is, um, so in this picture, when you sort of look for the compatible surfaces outside, you have to play with the log growths of the catenoidal lens. Right? They have to be perturbed slightly in order to get this to satisfy this compatibility condition. So you've started with two catenoids of exactly the same scale, so these two top ends have precisely the same log growth. Right? So if they're perturbed in the wrong direction, then you're going to get a surface which intersects, self-intersects at very near infinity. Right? So let me just mention one thing, that this guy is not embedded. Uh, by, this is a theorem of Ross. In, uh, I don't remember when it's from, but uh, uh, the reason, so basically, uh, relative to the topology, the, the surface has too many symmetries. So I think the theorem states that uh, if a surface is, uh, has like 4G plus 4 symmetries, uh, uh, so every minimal, embedded minimal surface in R3 has less than uh, or equal to 4G plus 4 symmetries, and equality is achieved only by the cost of Hoffman unique surfaces which have three ends, right? Okay, so clearly this thing can't happen. So as a silver lining, though, uh, it's kind of funny. You can actually compute with, it, with these methods exactly where these guys intersect, right? So you, the method is, you know, we refined our methods by a significant amount so that you can actually just look, you can compute exactly where, where these guys want to intersect. So you can compute the difference in the log growth of the ends. So what I mean by exactly is you can, uh, given any sort of error term, you can choose tau and theta sufficiently small, right? So that you can compute exactly the intersection circle up to uh, a term that goes to zero in, in, in tau and theta. So you can figure out basically exactly where these guys want to self-intersect again. Uh, okay. Let me uh, say a few more things. Ah. So maybe the next example I, I'd like to talk about is some sort of doubling construction. So it turns out that allowing this angle to go to zero while keeping the geometry, uh, geometry bounded, uh, the topology bound, I should say, is sort of exactly what you need in order to do various doubling constructions. So suppose, just for example, suppose one has a sphere. And just suppose for this example, it's maybe not purely rosettic, but let's just, uh, symmetric, but let's just sort of assume for simplicity that it's left, right symmetric and uh, up, down symmetric. Um, now I want to assume that the sphere has a covering uh, by two sets that look uh, something like this, right? So there's going to be two, basically a union of uh, two spheres minus, a, uh, well, okay, just two disks. Uh, I want to call this guy maybe omega one. Let's call this guy omega two. And I want to assume something about these coverings. So, uh, okay, so actually in this case, let's assume this guy has a nice rotational symmetry here. So I'm going to assume that uh, if you look at the linearization of the, the minimal surface equation for whatever it is in this manifold, so yeah, so this is a minimal sphere, so that we're not talking about uh, Euclidean space. Uh, let's, I want to sh show, let's assume that if you look at the first eigenvalue for the stability operator on each of these lambda i's, let's just assume that it's equal to zero, right? So this is still a rotationally symmetric category. It's maybe not that far afield, right? So again, for lack of better terminology, I'd like to, let me just call, maybe it's a little mystifying in this special case, but I want to call uh, this guy a, uh, a null annular covering. By the way, I'm taking suggestions from the audience if they have any better terminology for this, because it's just, uh, I don't use this terminology in my, in my personal life. It's just to uh, figure I needed it for the talk. So I'm very flexible on this. Uh, right. 
So I'm assuming we have a nice minimal sphere, rotationally symmetric, and it has a covering like this by uh, surfaces, uh, by disks, uh, two disks with a zero first eigenvalue for the stability operator. Then I claim the following thing, that uh, this nice rotationally symmetric sphere is doubleable. OK. So roughly, why would this be true? Well, if you straighten out, let's just sort of look near the intersection of these two disks, like this, and just sort of straighten out the picture so it's a little bit easier to draw. Well, what I want to do is I want to draw some uh, multiples, the first eigenfunctions at these points for these domains. And I want to draw their negatives downstairs. Uh, and then what I want to do is I want to remove a portion of these graphs that lies below the intersection. So this is supposed to be minus u1, minus u2, like this. OK. Uh, so if you extend the picture, uh, so basically what we've done here is if you extend the picture all the way back out to the, to the, to the full sphere, then these guys just sort of wrap around and go to the other side. Right? So again, so uh, my feeling is, uh, uh, as somebody who does this stuff, that it's relatively sort of, it's kind of, kind of like a, so, a home science project, right? You take surfaces and you try to uh, sort of, you saw out the portion of the intersection, you take the shirk surface and bend it so that it fits the intersection, and you try to glue it in, right? So what we've basically done is just assume the condition that allows us to stick the shirk surface in somewhere, right? This is the crudest thing that you need to be able to do, just stick the shirk, the shirk surface in somewhere. So this, uh, joint right here, which I'm going to call balancing curve, uh, is sort of a natural place to do it. Um, so if you look at the, uh, the, the sort of asymptotic geometry of a Shirk surface, it sort of pretty closely matches this. So that, uh, that joint right there. The problem is, well, actually, not the problem is that, so if this angle, if you call this angle theta, and then by smoothness, this height right here is roughly equal to theta as well. So on the other hand, if you look at the short surface right here, if this angle is theta, then this height is roughly equal to theta log theta. So it's much larger. So in order to get this short surface to actually fix, uh, fit the joint, you multiply the short surface by a very small factor uh, called tau which is just basically 1 over log theta. Uh, so when tau goes to 0, so basically what you do is you take these shirk surfaces, you shrink them down by this very small factor tau, and then they fit the joint pretty closely. And uh, you apply the same process. So essentially, you just take a nice disk and remove it. And maybe if you like, you blow everything up and straighten, it, straighten everything out. So I want to, this inner circle to play the role of T again. And uh, as before, you get a nice natural place to insert our circ surfaces. And as tau goes to zero, the picture converges back to this one, at least locally. You get some blow-ups of these graphs, of these, uh, of these uh, linear, linear solutions. And you play the same game as before. You solve inside, you solve outside. Um, and uh, you try to apply the, uh, the Dirichlet Neumann map into, from that point of view. OK, so in this context, it's a little, bit, a little bit more difficult than before, because at first glance, there's a little bit lack, uh, less freedom compared to what we had in the Euclidean case. Right? So in, if, if you imagine this was a Euclidean world, we remember we were able to solve outside. Not only it solved the Dirichlet problem, we can do this in more than one way we could prescribe the log growth of the catenoid that we get. So in this case, we have no such luck. Right? We're just fixed with a single solution to the Dirichlet problem. Right? So in particular, compatibility, as we said before, is going to be a little bit of an issue. Right? So how do we get around this? Well, if you think about what we actually needed in the Euclidean case, we needed to be able to uh, prescribe arbitrary affine functions 
ge with, uh, with some various geometric parameters. So basically, when tau is very small, or when tau is equal to zero, this converges back to the straight line case. And uh, so basically, what all I'm saying by that is that the catenoids uh, blow up to just straight lines, and catenoids at different intersecting the, this, uh, this tube at different angles correspond to different straight lines, or I should say planes, or something like this. So what we need to be able to find is, at least geometrically up to very small perturbation terms, we need to be able to find uh, some geometric parameters that allow us to prescribe uh, arbitrary affine functions in the kernel along these wings. Right. So how do we do that? Well, at this point, it's just somewhat on a heuristic level, if you want to proceed. Uh, uh, it's just basically just parameter counting. So if you look, uh, if you call this space four tuples of affine functions, we need to be able to span it. And we have at least an eight parameter family of affine functions at the outset. So we have uh, four from the configuration. So basically, we can just take slightly different multiples of these uh, first eigenfunctions on these domain, right? You can just change, take slightly different multiples and change the angles slightly. That gives us four, uh, sort of four parameters to play with that generate four affine functions. Uh, we also have four approximate uh, isometries. I'm calling them isometries, again, uh, for lack of a better terminology. So you also have four parameters that you can play with with, with your shirk surface, which, ge which generate uh, four affine functions along the wings. So you have two translations, a rotation, and then you can vary theta, uh, the actual shirk parameter. All these things generate affine maps along the, along the wing. So the question is, are these four, four guys linearly independent in, in our space A? And it turns out they are. So essentially, the, in the Euclidean case, some of the work was hidden because we had these nice uh, actual isometries that we could, we could use. We were allowed to translate the uh, catenoidal lines up and down without getting any, uh, inducing any error. In this case, we have to work a little bit harder, but everything works exactly the same. We have enough parameters, and the parameters produce linearly independent uh, guys so that we can actually uh, prescribe the compatibility as we needed before. OK. So, So there's a nice, another example which works, actually a concrete example, if you take S2 in, S, in R3 uh, uh, as a self-shrinker. So it turns out this guy has a nice null annual covering. Um, it looks something like this. So it actually has three uh, components. Looks something like this. And the same idea works, except that you have more intersection curves. But this, precisely the same process works. So the reason why uh, I'm calling this a null annual covering is because this works for, if you take a covering like this, uh, a, a generic one will contain many more annual items as caps. All right. So, the, the, the following thing also works. Uh, right, so no matter how many uh, uh, guys you have in your covering, right, do I have the, right, okay, then any such sphere is gonna be doubleable in the following sense, or in, in the sense that I just said. Okay, um, let's see here. Okay, so what one, one would really like to do is leave the rotationally symmetric category. Right, so uh, let me just, which we have not done yet, so let me just actually just start writing conjectures on the board. So I'd like the following thing. Take the following conjectures. 
uh, I'd like any sphere with a null annual covering can be doubled. Um, the second is that uh, same, uh, let me say any minimal sphere. Uh, same goes for other topologies. So the last thing I'd like to, to mention is that this null annual covering, so it's an, or I think it's a little bit of an overall, over, overly strong condition, but it's implied by uh, the fact that uh, uh, if your surface, if your sphere is non-degenerate and unstable, so it has at least one negative eigen, uh, eigenvalue. The stability operator has at least one uh, one negative eigenvalue. Okay, um, so in the case of a sphere, how to generalize the arguments to uh, the non-rotationally symmetric world is relatively clear. And it's actually it's clear for a torus as well. Um, the difficulty, so basically in order to do, to leave the rotationally symmetric category, what you have to do is be comfortable bending surfaces not around circles, but over more arbitrary curves. So this is an interesting problem in its own right. Um, I've studied an analogous theorem, or, or what is it? Okay, I've studied an analogous thing in slightly different contexts, uh, where you don't bend uh, shirk surfaces, but you bend helicoids. So if you take helicoid and you bend it along an arbitrary curve, arbitrary smooth curve, where various places accelerating and decelerating uh, the rate of winding. Uh, then you can correct this guy back to minimality, so as long as you stay in a, a small tube whose radius uh, depends. It uh, uh, depends on the, uh, the ge geometry of the, of the curve. And so there's something you have to, some restriction, of course, you have to put on, uh, on the way in which you vary the, uh, the um, uh, the scale of the helicoid along the curve, but it's, it's quite general, and you can get away with. Uh, so, if, so this this rate of winding is approximately the scale of the helicoid, which we want to call lambda, and lambda needs to be uh, basically something con convexly pinching. But it's quite general, and it allows you to find limits of these guys that pick up. Uh, that are limit, minimal laminations with singularities on uh, compact subsets of lines. Uh, so this was all done with PDE, PDE stuff. So some analogous problems had been sort of studied before by various people, by myself, uh, by Brian White and Hoffman, I think. It's David Hoffman, right? Okay, I've never met him, so I don't know his first name. Uh, right, so Hoffman and White, and uh, also by Bill Meeks, who I haven't seen for a few days. Uh, so, but these guys, these were sort of approach, so my, appro my approach and my thesis and White's uh, were, were sort of done with very different methods. So I used the bias stress representation. Uh, Hoffman White used, uh, uh, what is it, uh, uh, geometric measure theory. And uh, uh, Bill Meeks did a slightly different problem. But uh, at least with the bias stress representation, it wasn't obvious to me how to generalize to different topologies. So with this uh, approach, all I did was just take a helicoid and actually bend it with your bare hands like you do in these distinguishing constructions and then try to correct the, the thing back to minimality. So the question is whether that argument goes over to, uh, what is it, uh, to shirk surfaces. And to me, there's not an obvious obstruction. But um, So basically, once you can bend shirk, uh, shirk surfaces around arbitrary curves while varying their, their scale, in a very restricted way, then you can uh, do conjecture, conjecture one 
uh, exactly as we described in the, in the previous example. Uh, the higher topologies, so the torus is very similar. You can also, the, uh, it, I haven't thought about this as carefully for the torus, but I think the same conditions give you the existence of this null annual covering. The problem with higher topologies is that you, you can get a null covering, but not a covering by annuli. Right, so if you have just a, just a random sort of surface, minimal surface with higher topologies, you can get a null covering, but when you do this, their intersections, their intersection curves are gonna be some weird graph. So you're probably gonna be stuck with placing necks, catenoidal necks along graphs. I still think it's possible, but it seems significantly more difficult. Uh, so perhaps some sort of, uh, once you get to the more general topology, uh, if you're interested in constructing these things in, in, in manifolds, maybe some sort of sweep out method would be a little bit better, but I don't know, it's a, it seems a little, uh, I have no idea, but I, I, think, I think it probably works. I have no idea if I'm capable of doing it. <laughs> so, all right, uh, that's it, I guess. Okay, thanks. Okay, any questions? Yeah, Graham. Yeah. Right. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, so if you start with the Shirk surface, right, and you, uh, if, so these things exist for all angles between their asymptotic planes. So if you start with the one with, uh, with orth uh, orthogonal angles, right, and you bend him around a circle of very large radius, you'll get a minimal, and do this process, you will get a cost of Hoffman-Beek surface. Right? So, and then you can say, it's kind of nice, because then you can say something relatively precise about the, the uh, log growth of, uh, uh, cost off meek surfaces with high genus, although I think people have already, I'm not sure if people have computed that precisely, but I've seen estimates before. Do those surfaces have the same uh, parameters as, same number of parameters as the short surfaces? Uh, so the cost off and meek surface, so there, I think there is a general, uh, there is a one parameter family of cost off and meek, cost off and meek surfaces for fixed genus, although I have trouble visualizing what it does. So apparently you take the, the middle end and uh, you sort of perturb its log growth from zero to positive, and eventually these things become, become uh, non-embedded. Uh, Hoffman is supposed to have a survey article, but it was written in the 90s, and apparently none of the PDFs made it online, so I haven't been able to see exactly what they look like. Okay, let's thank the Stephen again. Thank you.